Hello everyone! My name is Kevin Alcuni and I'm a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department with the, uh, of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm Diana Levo Posner. I am the Principal Librarian and Associate Director of the Exploration and Creativity Department. And we are here to welcome you to today's Big Read program, Charles Yu in Conversation. All right. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Uh, we would also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants, who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside in, check out native-land.ca, and it's right down there. And now on to today's program. The Los Angeles Public Library is proud to present Charles Yu, an author of this year's Big Read, Interior Chinatown. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Charles is the author of four books, including Interior Chinatown, the winner of the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction, and How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe. He has received the National Book Foundation's uh, five under 35 award and was nominated for two Writers Guild of America awards for his work on the HBO series Westworld. We also wanted to inform our viewers that due to a scheduling conflict, Jean Yang is not able to be here. He, is, he apologizes for missing this great program today. Finally, those attending this virtual program who live by one of our 73 locations, we'll have an opportunity to win a free copy of Interior Chinatown. So you'll be able to email ecdept at lapl.org. And we'll put that in the chat. It's right down there too. And you'll be entered into the opportunity drawing and winners will need to pick up the book at their local Los Angeles Public Library. And you're always a winner because you could also check the book out for Double free. win. Win-win. Yeah. And now let's welcome Charles. Yay. Hi. Thanks What's up? Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we thought we'd kind of uh, break it up. We'll kind of talk about your uh, journey towards writing, through writing, and then um, afterwards we can tackle into your Chinatown. How does that, does that sound? All right. And then if people do have questions or comments, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, we're going to save uh, some of those for um, at the end of the program as well. All right. So before you became a full time writer, you worked as a lawyer for 13 years. Is that correct? That is correct. In corporate law? Uh, yes, that's yes. where I started. And then I sort of transitioned to a couple of different things that are probably not worth <laughs> everyone's <laughs> sure. time. But, but I, yes, I started as a corporate lawyer. Yeah. Wow. Do you remember what your last day as a lawyer was like, or what case you were on? Like, uh, well, do you have any recollection of your pre uh, full time writer Charles U. Life? I, I, it's just a hazy memory now. Um, it was uh, sad a little bit, honestly. I kind of mm -hmm. remember, you know, with the boxes, because you know, I have a lot of friends, you know, uh, who are still lawyers, and my, all my coworkers that were at the job that I left, and other people I worked with over the years. So um, there was a kind of, you know, it was a little bittersweet, a little scary, but also incredibly exciting because I had been writing at that point for, you know, a long time, as long as I had been a lawyer. And so I had totally, I don't know, come to terms with the idea of I write and I practice law and those are sort of, I, I do both. And then the idea of, you know, full time writing, which was really, to be clear, the transition was enabled by being able to do writing for television. Mm -hmm. That's where, like, financially and logistically, I was able to, like, make the leap. Um, that was just a scary new thing. So, yeah, the last day was like me 
putting my stuff in my car, saying goodbye and just wondering what, you know, what the new adventure would be like. Yeah, it must have, yeah, it must have had a lot of different feelings going on, like leaving a pretty, uh, I guess what people would consider a solid, uh, you know, job and venturing off into a new thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have two kids. So at that time, they were um, seven and five. And yeah. it just moved, you know, from LA, from Santa Monica to uh, Orange County here, where we live now in Irvine. And I was giving up, yeah, a very kind of solid, safe career where I had a lot of friends and enjoyed the work. And I didn't, I, I won't say like, I loved, you know, it the way I love writing, but mm -hmm. I, I was like, this is a very comfortable existence. You know, sure. what am I doing? I get home every night for dinner and I see my kids and wife a lot. And now I'm going to do this new thing where I'm starting, you know, effectively starting a new career at that right. point, you know, close to 40, you know, having just got, ha have a, a new mortgage, um, commuting from Orange County to Burbank every day. Wow. Um, what am, what am I doing? Uh, but it was also incredibly exciting because I was going to write for this big HBO show, Westworld, and, um, you know, just get to do that for a living was such a dream. Yeah. Uh, do you want to ask the next question, Diane? Uh, where are we at now? Because I was so in, into the lawyer. <laughs> it's the second part on the page. I heard that part? Yeah. Okay. You can tell we've practiced so. We I mean, yeah, very, 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 very practiced. Ran our lines. Okay, I heard that before. Before going into law school, uh, you had applied to engineering school and then medical school before finally settling on law school. Oh wow, go big, Charles, or go home. Look at all this. Wow. During this pretty intensive time, were you doing any creative writing at all? And what was what was pre-professional writer Charles like? Hmm. Besides yeah. very intense with going medical school, engineer. <laughs> right. And then law school. Yeah. Well, yeah, medical school, that is true. Engineering school was, that's almost, it's uh, just to, just for the record, in case anyone cares, uh, it was that I thought about doing engineering as a major at Berkeley. And um, so I did take quite a few classes my first couple of years there that would have, um, you know, been towards that. But, mm -hmm. uh, I figured out pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be an engineer. <laughs> uh, my dad is an engineer. He's a, he's retired now, but he was an aerospace engineer for many years mm -hmm. or McDonnell Douglas then Boeing. And, um, and so, uh, and I was, you know, pretty, pretty good at math and science in high school. Um, well, I thought I was until I got to Berkeley and then I was like, Oh, <laughs> I'm barely floating above, you know, the cut line here. I was just like, struggling to stay afloat and 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 so and also the, the bigger thing is my parents actually wanted me to be a doctor they that's mm. what their dream for me was i think for themselves but also for me they thought my temperament would would be suited for that profession mm -hmm. and that anyway so i did actually complete that i mean i pre-med's not a major but i was a i was pre-med i majored in biochemistry uh, so I was a very unremarkable student in, in biochemistry, um, but I did it. Um, and I did a minor in creative writing at Berkeley. Ah. You had to like apply to these workshops. So I applied and I started to get into them after getting rejected a couple of times, but I got in, then I started taking them alongside my, you know, my science course load took a lot of English classes, took writing classes. So I wrote poems and I, you know, was part of the kind of undergraduate or I guess campus literary community. Like I worked mm -hmm. for literary magazines, volunteering, reading submissions, you know, doing admin work and that sort of thing. And I, I was really into it. I loved it, went to readings. Uh, senior year, you know, I applied to medical school. I didn't get in. Uh, there was a there was definitely a sad day <laughs> in the household. Where my friend, what are you going to do with your life now? Mm -hmm. uh, and for probably about 30 seconds, I thought about applying to an MFA program. And that was like, mm -hmm. no, I mean, I, I, I think I didn't have the guts to really try it. I didn't know mm -hmm. if I did. I knew my parents would definitely not be supportive. So I applied to law school. 
that was <laughs> that's that's how I ended up as you know anyway that's how I ended up going to law school. Wow, where'd you go to law school? Just out of curiosity. I went to Columbia. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Oh. So I wanted to go right. to New York. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that seems good. Yeah, I mean, you... it was great. It was very challenging. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Were, were you still doing? like creative wise, like how were you kind of expressing yourself at that time? Or was that something you weren't pursuing as actively? I mean, just as a recreational, you know, kind of outlet, but was that something you were still doing a lot of or um, how did, I guess, how were you able to devote energy and time to that? Was that something that you did, creative endeavors? Mm, once I got to law school, I stopped. Actually, once I graduated, I took a year off. I was working while I applied to law school and I pretty much stopped um, writing. I didn't write po poems after I graduated. It's something mm -hmm. I clicked where it said, oh, you need to earn money now. And <laughs> any minute you're spending, I don't know, something in me clicked. So, but I did continue to read a lot, you know, mm -hmm. um, not, not just for school, but in New York, I read a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was how, and, and I didn't, I don't think I was necessarily thinking that I would write, but then when I graduated law school, um, you know, the summer before you, for a lot of people the summer after you graduate you're studying for the bar mm -hmm. you probably know where you're going to work if you're lucky enough and so i had a job at a firm i had to study for the bar um and so it, instead of studying for the bar i went to the bookstore and read a lot of <laughs> read a lot of <laughs> books. so that's where i decided i was going to try to write short stories as mm -hmm. i entered the workforce oh. Cool. Yeah. Just just reading a lot kind of sparked a, a re sparked maybe um, a desire to start writing again. I think that's what it was. It re sparked it. It was like I yeah. kind of knew I'm going to have to go into this profession and into this environment where there probably won't be a lot of room for creativity and personal yeah. expression. It's really about grinding, you know, 80 hours a week at the, at the law firm. Something in me was like, you're going to need some kind of outlet. So mm -hmm. that right. was my little outlet. Yeah. Wow. Well, and as librarians, we're glad the reading brought you home. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Always. Definitely. And then um, just out of curiosity, while you were um, while you were in law school and, and, and working in law, uh, what was your younger brother Kelvin doing at that time? Because he also is in the entertainment industry as an actor and a writer. Um, uh, was he also interested in like creative endeavors in the same way you were? And how did your parents react to the kind of different career choices that you both made? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, um, he was actually already in the entertainment industry um, yeah. <laughs> I, as early as, yeah, when I went to law school, it was 98. Um, and in 1999, he was cast in a television show called Popular, which was created by Ryan Murphy, I think, who has mm -hmm. gone on to create um, mm -hmm. many sort of, you know, incredibly well-known shows. Um, so so uh, my brother was still an undergrad at UCLA at that time, but he was on a TV show, um, which is really neat, obviously. So he, that was the beginning of kind of, I guess, his professional career. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he, he had gone to study, he had gone to UCLA to study acting, but he didn't end up doing his major in theater. He ended up graduating with something else. But I mean, once getting that job, he was kind of in it. So he right. acted and wrote. And then a few years later, he got staffed on a Fox show called Bob's Burgers, which is still on the air. And, and now he's like a creator, showrunner. He's... Um, He's done incredibly well, but he still acts. He still does both. So I guess um, to answer the second part of your question, Kevin. Um, so growing up, I was like expected to be the doctor. <laughs> and I think my parents were hoping he'd be a lawyer, you know, because they're like immigrants who are like, you both need to do something high paying and stable. Right. And Charlie, you're very boring and serious. <laughs> Wow. Should be a doctor. I mean, I'm not basically this is shorthand, but not sure, really. sure. I get it. There's a little bit more of a tact to expressing that, but yeah. Yeah, not much. I mean, they're pretty okay. clear. Like you just, <laughs> this is what you should do. And Kelvin, you're very outgoing. And I mean, I think their conception of what a lawyer is is like TV lawyers. So like oh. 
you know, mm -hmm. impassioned arguments to a jury. So they thought, well, you'll be good at that. So, and then he ended up being an actor, but actually they were, you know, they knew because he had been doing it all through school and yeah. you know, had success, you know, kind of as a student, but they knew that it was something he really wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. He supported it. I think as a younger kid, honestly, it's, he got the, the younger sibling got a little more leeway. I was yeah, like, I see. Yeah. Had to carry the academic banner for the family and but he he like did incredibly well academically too he just he just ended up doing he something. just loved acting and writing yeah. and being yeah and, and the yeah. creative engines yeah all right i think we can move over to interior chinatown diane all right <clears throat> i'm enjoying the, the brother thing because i have two sons so i was like mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, um can you speak to the uh, genesis of interior chinatown what sparked your interest and how did you eventually land on the format? Yeah. Um, by the way, how far apart in age are your two sons? Um, five years. One just um, graduated from UC San Diego and then he got into the master's program, the one year one from in aerospace engineering. So I was also like enjoying your aerospace. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, the right. younger one is in finishing his senior year in high school. Oh, wow. But yeah, the difference. It's yeah, I, the younger one I say it has the has the snarky uh, com com comedic side and yeah, but the older one has some zingers too. So <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll end up with two comedians. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And then Kevin and I will put them on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it's <like> perfect. <laughs> um, the genesis was um, is like. I had published a my third book, which was a collection of short stories, and I owed my publisher another book, so I said I have to write a book. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm bringing it up because it's somewhat relevant because it's the first and so far only thing that I've ever written where the contract was signed. You know, I had sold something that I had not written yet, um, wow. and that is both a luxury you know credible privilege and dream in some ways but also uh turned out to be like you know a bit of a difficulty because there was a lot of pressure yeah what is this going to be is it you know and the the creative genesis of it was i had um some pages basically that related to the characters that ended up being the parents in the novel. Mm -hmm. uh, Ming Chen and Dorothy Wu are old Asian man and old Asian woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what to do with them, those pages. I had, I don't know, probably 50 to 60 pages, depending on how you count it. Um, and they just sort of like floated around for a while. You know, I, I tried to you know, stuff them in different containers. I tried to like build things around that as a kind of emotional core, but it was really the story of these two characters coming to the to the United States, you know, as young, relatively young people in their twenties and trying to assimilate and what it kind of exploring what that meant. What, what difficulties did they have, you know, both with language and culture and mindset and just what were their lives like, you know, to land both of them, these characters and my my actual parents um, landed in the South to start with, you know, and sort of what was that like? And a lot of it was based on, you know, stories, things that my parents had told me over the years. So that's where I started. Um, and it took a long time, honestly, I, I went through, I had a lot of false starts with this book. I didn't know because it, I think I was trying to maybe conform in my own head to some concept of what like an, a serious novel would be about this immigrant experience. And either I'm not a good enough writer to pull that off, or I just wasn't interested in that, probably a little bit of both. Sure. but i was just boring myself you know yeah. i just like oh, this is boring so if it's boring me it's gonna bore readers and um and so that's where i was for a long time and then somewhere along the line somewhere along the way i started working in tv and i think it took a while but the idea this 
sort of screenplay idea of like, um, what if their lives were basically the lives of background characters mm. in a story where they're not really important? That form unlocked, you know, it felt like, okay, this is the form I've been searching for right. that connects to the subject matter in an intrinsic way that I can't, you know, but it, it unlocked something and, and suddenly felt like, oh, now I kind of either I get what I'm doing or I'm interested enough to kind of keep writing sentences about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And kind of following up on that, I read that you wrote three different versions of the book, but that you had to throw away the first two. Yes. Yeah. What, <laughs> what did it feel like to have to start over twice? <laughs> oh, sorry. What did it feel like to have to start over twice? And when did anything survive from those first two versions before you landed on the third? Um, yeah, it didn't feel great. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, it, it's painful. And yet the moment you make that decision, it's kind of, it's liberating. Sure. Yeah, like, it's free. Yeah. Ugh. But also, okay. You know, like yeah. I don't have to carry that thing around anymore. Right. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the work, the path, you need that path. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, maybe that's just. Well, I think you put in the work that it's, it's the creative journey. And so you're, you're searching different avenues to find the voice and the tone that you want. And, you know, I think a lot of times it's not always apparent in uh, having to experiment, you know, with the writing and the style and trying to find what it is you're trying to say, you know, it's, it's work and, uh, right. You know, but yeah, no one likes, no one likes having to start over twice. Um, no. but, <laughs> yeah. But liberating at the same time, because you're like, Ugh, this isn't working and acknowledging that and not stopping trying to fix something that it isn't. But uh, from those two versions, uh, what were some of the things that you kind of did manage to carry over or or, or were there certain things that you, know, you brought over to the to the final version? Um, there, I mean, the core pages about the parents survived pretty, mm -hmm. pretty much intact. Yeah. Um, oh, did we oh. Lose Diane? Yeah, she she was having she she'd be right back. She okay. she had some internet issues. She was bored. She was like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> She's like speaking of it. Yeah. <laughs> <She's not bored. laughs> Twenty two minutes in, she's like, mm, mm. all right. Yeah. Um, no, I uh, yes. So those pages survived. Um, I you know I I feel like bits of it survived, but a lot of it didn't. But I think what survived was the realization that I wouldn't get there through um just learning what didn't work to what i think yeah. you were just saying like i needed to take so just to give a little more specifics the first like the first real shot i gave it or the first form it took was uh, i called it the book of wishing and it was like a bunch of i i conceived it as a as a bunch of like fairy tales um that so I was I think you know to use a blanket term is sort of like magical realism. Okay. The idea being like these immigrants come to a new land and the process of assimilation is inherently sort of magical. Like you don't exactly know um, how it happens. You know, there's some kind of a black box, and so the. And I thought there would be something interesting in that. Like, I'm here, I want to transform into something else, which is an American, you know, and how do how does that process happen? It seems kind of magical to these new immigrants. Um, I just never quite, I think I never quite figured out how to make it work. I think either I'm not a good enough magical realist or I'm not a good enough, um, or it, it just wasn't the right form. I think right. more it's that it's like um I so so then I scrapped that and I and I guess what came out of that is um knowing that I had to be a little bit more concrete because I think I was hoping that I would just put some stuff on the page and it would magically <laughs> um, <laughs> it would root itself down into like real thoughts and yeah yeah and then the next form was actually also kind of magical realism it was uh the magical properties of everyday objects and it was trying to um 
that was more of like a detective story with magic mm -hmm. in it. And that was almost sort of like two things. I was like, well, magic wasn't enough. Let's throw a detective story in there. <laughs> um, I, I'm saying this partly not because I think it's inherently interesting, but maybe if there are writers, or maybe it's also interesting for non-writing readers, but just to know, I guess, just how much failure was involved in this process, you know? Um, and and how, I don't know if that's interesting in itself, but- I but, think it is because people, I, I think people who don't write and just, you know, maybe they're active readers, but they just assume one thought, one shot, and then it's, you know, it's done and it's not. The journey is nebulous. Uh, you don't know how it's gonna end. You give it to people and then they're pointing out things. It's, you know, it, it's all new terrain all the time, in my mm -hmm. opinion. And so, you know, working through those things, it's hard work and, uh, you know, when it's when it reads easily on the page, no one sees all of the labor that went into making the work mm -hmm. uh, seem seamless, seem easy to manage. And, you know, making the hard thing seem easy is the, you know, it's the sign of a professional. So, I, you know, I think it's interesting. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love, I think that's, you really distilled it, Kevin, because it the, making the hard thing seem e seem easy is the is is just really that when you've spent that many years learning what didn't work mm -hmm. it does crystallize at some point but it's only because you tried everything else yeah a hundred different things and yeah. just like go back to it the next things like damn it it didn't really st or whatever you know and then sometimes it takes a long time before you realizing like oh this pathway it's not leading <laughs> to anything so right yeah um yeah if you want to ask the next one diane okay and sorry i dropped out my 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 fi went yeah. down because the weather's good or something it just went away yeah. but i yeah. found you guys okay right. you've mentioned that your editor tim o'connell and your agent julie Farrow were incredibly astute readers and were able to catch some of your blind spots when writing this book do you recall what some of their observations were and how did they help shape the novel yeah, yeah, they were the first readers of the book. Um, even before my wife, Michelle, she was the mm -hmm. third reader. But um, they, you know, helped structure it in a larger sense, just, you know, at some point, it was 250 pages, but in the wrong order. And so, <laughs> um, something, you know, you get stuck in a certain in a certain, like mental picture map of what the thing should right. be as it takes right. also just they're better readers than i am you know because that, that's what they do but they're also exceptionally good but yeah it, it's just it, it, you're too close to it sometimes when you're the writer or often right i think that's and part how did they kind of uh, give you that feedback was it in a way where you were able to kind of take it in and see what their vision was and then meld it to what worked for you or yeah basically it was you know you know, a combination of emails and phone calls and very meticulous line edits, you know, no. macro, starting macro and then getting to the line editing process. Gotcha. Where, and, you know, the big thing, if I had to zero in on one thing that they really helped with was um, kind of like the confusion around like what, how am I supposed to understand exactly what Willis's reality is? Like, is he... Are there cameras around? Is he is he living in a, you know, on a movie stage or sound stage? Does he live in a movie studio? Or like, how real is this? And um, I think there were just honestly just basic logical questions of like, if a reader is to try to get into this, like, how are they supposed to understand what they're seeing in their mind's eye? And honestly, it was a at times it, you know, I don't want to say it got heated. We're always we a lot of love, but it got frustrating for me because they were asking good questions so right. that I didn't want to answer. That I wanted to be like, you don't understand, you'll never understand. And um, but by the process of them pushing me to try to articulate, sometimes they would point, they'd poke holes, and I go, "You're right. That's a soft spot. I need to fix that." There need to be rules of the world that are consistent so that the whole thing, the, this this contraption works or this building doesn't fall down. And then, honestly, there were a few points where we got down to the heart of the matter and I 
realized I actually don't want to pinpoint an answer for you. I'd like to have it both ways. Oh, Meaning like, I don't want to be able to answer for you. Yeah, does Willis, you know, what is his reality? I want to leave it ambiguous to some degree mm -hmm. uh, because that's kind of the point. And meaning like, is he aware, you know, that he's, you know, like, because I think Willis's dual awareness of his status, his dual awareness of being, you know, having an Asian face, but having an interior consciousness that doesn't always show to the world. I think that is reflective of something that a deeper thing that I was trying to scratch at, you know, mm -hmm. It's it's true of my own experience as someone who was born and raised in the U.S. I'm fully American. I've never lived anywhere else. And yet I feel like I look through, at the world through this kind of weird, you know, like kind of blinkered, you know, like there's times where I'm very aware and there's other times where I kind of have this weird blind spot. And I think that's true of Willis's kind of consciousness or self-awareness as well so uh they tim and julie were really instrumental in like getting us to the getting the book to the point where um okay we could go okay you've isolated your core like i don't know if i don't want to call it an insight but the thing that you don't want to reduce any further mm -hmm. we'll just leave that there if that's really what you want then that's what you want so they help me understand what i want because they probably understand it better than i do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That must have been. <clears throat> How long would you say that process was? That that give and take before you kind of were able to agree that um, kind of a nebulous nature for certain, certain aspects is. Or I guess did you have to feel confident enough that they would push and you could push back and argue for your vision? I guess maybe some of that. Yeah, that was. I mean, it, you know, it felt like forever. In reality, <laughs> it was probably about a year and a half from when oh, yeah, I, it was yeah it was a long time it was real frustrating where i kind of broke the book down again and built it back up this time not reinventing it just like trying really hard to figure it out and um yeah probably between 12 and 18 months wow, wow. um all right maybe we should go into the um some of the questions yeah so we have a we have a lot of questions coming in so yeah Lots so yeah so we could uh, read from some of the high school student questions, and then uh, we can get into the uh, the comments um, afterwards. How does that sound? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So these are some questions from the students of Mendez High School. Um, do you want to do you want to read the first one we talked about, Diane? Sure. sure. The first one. I mean, there was a few, but we honed it down. So thanks, yeah. Mendez High School. What yeah. is your karaoke? What is your karaoke song? Oh my gosh! That's, that's from Diana. That it, it used to be How Deep Is Your Love by the Bee Gees. <laughs> I don't, Would you I don't go full, full Bee Gees? Yeah. Um, I like Beyond the Sea by Bobby Darren, too. Oh, I like that one, yeah. Ah, classic. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Um, they also wanted to know, um, did you? who were your heroes when you were growing up? Ooh. Um, hmm, that's tough. Um, I mean, Bruce Lee was one. Oh, yeah. Um, Bruce Lee. Andre the Giant. I, I was a big. Oh. <laughs> Just because he was so big. Was so big. Yeah. Seven foot four, 500 pounds. Um, I mean, that's that's a, that's quite a duo. I don't know if I can top that. But, yeah. uh, I mean, that's hard. Yeah. Can you imagine a movie with Andre the Giant and Bruce Lee? Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess following up because one of the other students wanted to know what is your favorite Bruce Lee movie? Oh, um, I think Fists of Fury is uh, a classic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, another another hero is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, Brilliant man. Mm -hmm. Were you a Lakers fan as well or just his overall? I was a Lakers fan for sure. I mean, I watched, you know, I grew up in L.A. So I was a Lakers yeah, and Dodgers yeah. fan growing up. Um, yeah. Okay. These are from, uh, we're going on. I want to do these from mm -hmm. uh, Center for the Arts um, Eagle Rock in Eagle Rock. And one of the ones we se selected How has storytelling been important to you in your life, which you've kind of revealed, um, and in your family's lives? Hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's been important. Just it's something I've been passionate about since I was a kid. I don't know why. Like, I think my parents really encouraged me to read a lot. Um, and so I, I was a very avid reader as a kid. I used to drag around this bag of books even before I knew how to read. I just was like, someday I'll read these books. And uh, and, uh, and now I still do that. I just buy books and I leave them. <laughs> That's, piles. That yeah, just piles. Someday yeah. I'll read those. Um, and honestly, like, I feel like storytelling is also just part of, I don't know, I guess my parents' experience as immigrants. Mm -hmm. you know, I just feel like the act of, the act of like being a family almost is kind of a story that you tell, like what, you know, what are we supposed to be doing for each other? How do we, mm -hmm. how do we define, you know, ourselves in relation to each other? And what's our, it's weird to say this, it sounds like, but like not what's our shared purpose, but like, I, I don't know, I guess as immigrants, my parents had such a hope and so many dreams that feels like a story, you know, it feels like mm -hmm. people that want to get somewhere from here they came here for a reason and they wanted to build lives and i think something about that must have inspired me wanting to tell stories because it, it felt like they wanted an, not an adventure but they wanted to i don't know have you know a journey i guess and so i think there's something about that that i can't quite put my finger on that yeah. made me want to write yeah well it's good that they told stories i mean i think yeah. I know for me, my uh, abuela telling stories, listening. I was an only child, so I would always be the one listening when all the uh, aunties, the tias would sit around telling stories, um, which has come in handy because now I'm like the holder of all this information for my cousins. They're always calling me. Mm. <laughs> you know, where was where our grandparents born? And where? And I was like, why do I have all? You guys were there too. Was I the only one listening? But yeah, I think stories are huge. You're the Very family cool. historian. What? You're, yeah. Are you the family history? I think and it's so important. Like, yeah. And yeah. sometimes the older cousins, there's something I don't remember. And I'm like, wait, we got to ask, we got to ask uh, PJ. He knows. He was the oldest. He has to remember. Um, but yeah, really important. Yeah. Um, another question from the Center for the Arts Eagle Rock. Um, and it's it's kind of general, so you can speak to it as, as you're, you know, you want to, but where do you feel most at home? Um, I know it's a pretty general question, but. Um, I guess it's speaking to some of the themes of interior Chinatown in general. And I guess they want to know, um, or for, for you as the author. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think when I'm with my, my family and loved ones or with really close friends, um, I, or honestly alone with a book. <laughs> like that. Now for getting honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where, where do you find time to read in your day? Well, currently not a lot other than for sure. work. Um, but, uh, but honestly, I make time. I mean, if, if I'm not like it, other than the current work situation, I mean, I, you know, I start the day reading, I end the day reading and I, any meal, I'm always just that that's my, like, I love having, you know, lunch with friends or whatever, but no friend will be a good book or a long magazine article. Um, sorry, friends, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, there's time for, you know, the interior life and there's time to be social. And yeah. um, it's, I think uh, writers need to constantly fill their reservoir of like things to kind of talk about on the page. And so reading is one of the ways that you uh, fill that reservoir with ideas and thoughts and just, you know, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we do some of Susan's, Diane? Yeah. Um, which one did All right. you I'm going to try and distill it. Um, it was a little bit of a longer question. It was long. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Susan, for also sending in the question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> not, a, a not, not a criticism, just a, just a simple observation. All right. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Some parts in the book were confusing about whether they were the actor scenes for the television show or if they were narrations of what was actually happening uh, to Willis. Uh, I guess she just kind of wanted to um, hear some of your thoughts on um, just, um, you know, the, I guess, uh, the different parts of the, of the, of the, of the novel and, um, you know, how it, 
where the metaphor and real life kind of intertwine with each other using, you know, magical realism as kind of like a spine, I would say. Right. No, and that's a great question from Susan. I, I think um, it's, and to the earlier question, that's one of the things that I wrestled the most with and crafting it that um, my editor and agent, Tim and Julie, uh, were asking about. It's like, are you, you seem to be creating this idea that Willis is an actor, but he lives in this weird reality and he seems to be like going back and forth like this. And so, and so that was one of the things that we had to work on. I think the idea is that Willis has internalized the idea of being generic Asian man number three to such an extent that it does get blurry. Like he is who other people. So to me, it's not just like actor and person underneath. It's like, who are we to other people? And who are we inside, you know, when underneath the mask? Mm -hmm. um, and for Willis, it's very confusing intentionally. I think he, he, he believes that he is how other people see him to some extent, and he has trouble distinguishing. So I think the idea is that the, the parts where, is he in a show or is he are these his thoughts? Is this what he's really doing? Or is this what's happening on TV? Um, it starts out, I think, somewhat clear, like uh, there's this police show and then there's Willis and his like life with his family. And then as, as he kind of gets more entwined with the police show, it becomes quite blurry where he can't tell the difference between who he wants to be mm -hmm. and who he actually is and inside and outside. So I, yeah. I have not answered Susan's question. I have just muddied the waters more, but <laughs> that's, that's really kind of the point. And I will. Oh. Hmm. I mean, it's frozen. Oh, I froze. Yeah. You're back. Am I back? Yep. Yeah, you're back. I'm back. Oh, my my high school son, he uh, they selected this book for his, um, I think, AP Lit class, and he was doing a discussion. And he said, because I said, hey, you have any thoughts? Well, I wanted to ask Charles anything. And he said, oh, oh no. Now I have to live in suspense. I know. Stay in, you're frozen again. Shall we back? No. All right. Well, we'll follow up. I won't forget. Oh, no, Kevin's frozen. Oh, no. Are we all frozen? Oh. Oh. Okay. Are we, am I back? Are you, You're back. As okay, far as I'm, I'm back. back. All right. Gotcha. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back to Diane's uh, comment. Um, and then the other question that uh, Susan Fukushima wanted to know was, um, it seems like there's been a lot of Asian American uh, content just being created, um, you know, over the past several years. Uh, Everything, everywhere, all at once. Beef, American-born Chinese, uh, interior Chinatown. Um, do you feel like this is something that's been slowly gaining momentum uh, for quite a while? And um, I don't know. I guess how does it feel as a creator? Um, you know, that there is so much more content. Because I remember, you know, I'm a child of the 80s as well. And I don't remember, I remember a Short Round from Indiana Jones. And yeah. yeah, you know, the same one in Goonies. And then that was kind of it for a really long time. So I guess, I guess if you can just kind of speak to the the amount of content that's being um, created. Um, and, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you feel about it? And how does it feel as a creator as well? Um, it feels great to be honest, to have so many voices and so many stories and also so many um, people get opportunities, right? It, both like professionally, personally, it, it just means so much. And the kinds of stories that are being told, I mean, I loved everywhere, you know, everything everywhere all at once. I loved, um, um, you know, I think the idea of like the Ki Kwan playing short round and then coming back and winning the Oscar is just, you couldn't, it's just unimaginable, honestly. But um, so, yeah, it, and it. I think I hope it continues to open doors. I mean, I will say, honestly, there's a, a, a part of me that's like, there's hi. Um, part of me that's a little bit like this is this is the moment like where maybe we get past 
the idea of even an Asian American project, I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't think it's right. like there's been 50 things, you know, or even 25 things, but, um, cause I would love to get to the point where it's just, you know, a project that has a bunch of Asian Americans in it isn't necessarily just defined that way. I think we kind of necessarily have to as well. Otherwise sort of could be repeating ourselves in a way. Right. How many times can we tell? stories from a certain point of view or um yeah. So yeah or i guess just how to expand upon it and just make it not a thing i understand what you're saying it's not a thing it's just it's a normal part of viewing just you know it's not highlighted as its own thing it would be neat yeah like th this is just a story that i love that's about characters that i find interesting right that are humans um, that happen to be Asian American. I think we're getting there, honestly. And I think that's really because of these groundbreaking projects that, you know, open the doors, tell certain kinds of stories. And then, you know, I'm lucky enough to hopefully get to build me and others that will come after. Hopefully we get to build off of the work in progress that, that uh, other people have made. Yeah, yeah. D Diane, we didn't want to forget um, uh, what did Owen wanted to ask? It just oh, no, it was basically Susan's question. The, oh, okay. the, you know, that it was confusing at parts, but then he said what, what Charles said. He said, but I realized he wanted to leave it so that the reader could decide. Right. Yeah, which I'm like, okay, you're brilliant. Go away. That was, <laughs> um, that was it. So, uh, yeah, I, I know you asked the other question. And there's there's some questions in the chat too, Kev. But there, we uh, have yeah, do you want to do you want to should we move to the chat questions? Sure. Unless there's the other there's two others. I don't know if you want to do art. Yeah. Well, or I mean, from Washington Irving Branch. Those are sure. You can ask the. Uh, do you want me to do that one? Yeah, that'd be Let's good. See. Do you always have in did you always have in mind that you would include real historic facts throughout the book, and what was your research process like to include those elements? Mm. Um, I don't think I always had it in mind. Um, I think it came out organically in the writing. It felt like Willis is going on this, hmm, he's getting an education, you know, um, it's mm -hmm. a sort of a coming of age story in some ways. And part of that education is learning um, not just the personal and individual history of his family, but the larger context, um, which includes, um, you know, laws and court cases that have shaped honestly have shaped stereotypes by creating categories for you know immigrants from asia um, and, and how something like legislation or language in a court ruling can actually be the basis for um like a perception, you know, like to call to characterize specifically, like some of the early laws and court cases characterized Asians as aliens that could not be assimilated, aliens incapable of assimilation. And um, that, and, and then the net effect of some of these things is like, you're taking a group of people and saying, you can't be American because you're so fundamentally different and you don't fit into our existing categories either. You don't fit into either. You're not a white person. You're not a black person. We don't really know what to do with you. Um, and so we will just literally exclude you. We'll close the door and say, um, you know, for, for many decades and the effect that had on both perception and on the base of people that were here actually that were sort of trapped here that persisted for a really long time and so that research came about naturally i guess um in trying to figure out um just sort of where some of these stereotypes came from basically right yeah well said um... I think, I think that's kind of it for the uh, the sent in question. Maybe we have we have about ten minutes left, so maybe we'll go through some of the uh, the um, the viewer yeah, there's comments like now. Fifteen, but a lot of them are saying how great the book is. Yeah, right. Um, how about this one by Susan Norton that came in? We put it on the screen. So, uh, oh, yeah. I believe Susan's mm -hmm. a teacher. 
Uh, she says, after the Monterey Park shooting last January, we, our AP English class, uh, probably couldn't help but notice that the phase, phrase, old Asian man in the media, what, what were your thoughts at the moment? And I guess maybe now. Yeah, I mean, it was um, obviously, thank you, Susan. Um, hard, you know, hard to obviously process that. And for that phrase of all phrases to sort of be part of it, I mean, it's almost too big and too close to home to, to really, um, you know, I, I don't, I, honestly, it's, it kind of goes to so many things that uh, I wrestle with still, you know, the, mm -hmm. the idea of um, for so long, um, older Asian people that were, you know, like my own parents um, are Americans, you know, they, they lived um, most of their lives here. 55, 60 years here. Um, and are there limits to assimilation? Are there limits to how much they could ever fully be perceived as fully American? Or honestly, even as subjective people with feelings and inner lives? I mean, that's a lot of the genesis of the book is empathizing with or asking readers who may not have considered the lives of these people to consider the lives of these people <laughs> right. in their interior lives. Um, it's obviously a very hard and disturbing thing to think about the loneliness and mental illness that would cause people to do, you know, to c commit incredible acts of violence. And, um, and so that's all part of the process as well as thinking about, um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, that's not really much of an answer, but it-, it, it no, no, I mean, you, yeah, you, yeah, you're verbalizing a lot. I mean, it's not one thing, it's it's a lot of different things. And I think, um, you know, it, it's a question that asks a lot of different, you know, there's a lot that's wrapped into something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, here, just show this one. Uh, did you ever work yourself up to an emotional frenzy while writing intense moments? <laughs> I saw that um, one. Like Hmm. Depends on when a frenzy. I mean, yeah. You, if you ask my wife, she would say yes. <laughs> um, I during intense moments. Yeah. I mean, I will say there are times where I've cried when I was writing. You know, where and I usually know that's. I don't want to say a good sign, but it's a sign that I'm onto something. It doesn't happen a lot. Um, sure. I I get excited. Yeah. I like. I can notice. Like I start to breathe a little faster. I'm like, oh, this is something. Uh, that also doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> Most of the times, the emotion is just frustration. And, uh, <laughs> it's tears of frustration. <laughs> turn on the TV, get a snack, give up, you know, walk my dog, something. Can, can I ask, like, uh, when you were writing into your Chinatown, like when you were on the third version of it, what was the what was the writing? Uh, what were your writing habits at that time? Because were you working on that while still writing for television? I was at the beginning. I was still in the, for I was in various writers' rooms. So that's how long I was writing the book for. I was writing for the, you know, the book for like between six and seven years. You know that the, all those false starts. So I, I had a bunch of jobs in between. Um, I started when I was a lawyer. And then I did a bunch of TV jobs, and then for the last couple of years, I was mostly at home because I was. Of focusing on the book. I was writing a couple of scripts for development, but right. um, that was both the best part, but also like the most kind of frustrating part because then I really had nothing standing in the way of it. I had no excuse. I just could focus on it pretty much all day. Was it like nine to three that you would work and then take like a long walk or was it kind of not arbitrary, but did you have to figure out like what your rhythm, like when are you most productive and when are you least and um anything like that i was i was yeah kind of a nine to something every day mm -hmm. you know if you really look at the productivity i i bet most of those days i'd start at, at eight or nine i didn't get anything done after 12 or one but i would often sit there till five or six you know i'd sit there all day but i didn't like all the right eight ninety percent of the writing was done probably within the first couple of hours and then i'm just sort of spinning but so sometimes I would learn that and I just take breaks from it or just say, if I'm not feeling it, 
it, it's such a chicken and egg thing. It's like sometimes when you're not feeling it, you go, I need to take a break and change my routine. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you realize, or I realize, if I don't put my butt in the chair, I'm never going to do the hard work of just like getting through these bad ideas or right. making my subconscious yeah. work at it. So how do I create the conditions where I'm somehow working on this inside in a way that will result in? Yeah, work. I think that's the frustrating part of writing is uh, yeah. hoping or sometimes you're not feeling it and you just said, oh, I'll just do a little bit. And then you're like, oh, I actually picked up something. And then sometimes you do it and you don't get anything and you're just back to frustration again. So. Yeah, for me, that's most days. I know there are writers who are like, I want to write this many words. I'm not like that. Most days I write pretty much nothing useful. <laughs> <laughs> but you think people should know? I think people should know that you can have an award-winning novel and just understand that, you know, it's mm -hmm. the work is difficult and challenging and, um, yeah. you know. For us, every day, just writing an email can be a whole thing. Like that. <laughs> or even <laughs> writing the intro script to uh, Charles. <laughs> Make it better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll take Susan one more. Susan has here. another really good question. I just want to say because she's show that one. Let me show that one. She's with some. She's with five high school juniors right now. They want to know oh. what high school did you go to? Oh wow! I went to Rolling Hills High School, and then it uh, changed names when I was there to Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. That's where I went. Yeah. And then um, we got one more uh, that came in. Um, what is your relationship with Los Angeles Chinatown? I volunteered for the mutual aid during the pandemic for the SROs and the way the novel captures life there was incredible. Oh, well, thank you. Um, honestly, I, you know, we'd go there to eat once in a while. I didn't, I grew up in LA, so I did go there. My parents would go there to shop sometimes or Monterey park, you know, or San Gabriel Valley. But, um, I'm not, you know, I didn't live in Chinatown. I never, I didn't live too close to it. It was, Kind of a special place to visit um, and also when i went to berkeley oakland chinatown became that too because it was so close to school so i did some volunteering there at a elementary school that was very had a lot of chinese americans and um and so it became a place of like oh this isn't something you know because i grew up kind of in the suburbs you know in west la at first and then we moved to the south bay and um it was this kind of place where I didn't feel like I was from there. I felt like an outsider for sure. And, mm -hmm. but also there was a weird connection underneath, like this is touching some part of me that I don't normally, you know, it's just like resonating mm -hmm. with something or I feel like a pull almost towards it. And I don't know why, well, I, mean, I think I could figure out why, but it's just parts of me that I, I either ignore or kind of push down. So I think in the course of writing the book, I wanted to sort of do some research, but also think about why you know what that means like for me so yeah it's i i appreciate it i've i i um and then now we've actually done some filming in la chinatown which is really neat to oh, actually go cool. there wow. yeah. i drive through chinatown every day going into work and i think i've seen when they're doing movies you know and and part, well, one of the best. buildings one of the buildings i remember used to be a one of the restaurants that's found the main and it's recently gotten so much graffiti on it but then like you look into the Chinatown, like, and it's just still like my childhood memory of just, you know, being excited to get to go to the Chinatown where you used to be able to throw your coins into the, oh, do you sure. guys remember that? the good wish area? Anyway. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, yeah, my kids went to, school, went to school in Chinatown. So um, I was there almost every day dropping oh. them off at Castellar. So um, we're almost out of time here. Um, I guess just any last thoughts or um, anything else you want to share with the audience before you sign off? No, I mean, I appreciate all the great questions. I hope uh, I hope I haven't scared anyone off of writing or reading the book. <laughs> um, I want to thank both of you, Diane and Kevin and like Steve and everyone for, you know, watching this and for reading the book if you have. And if you haven't, um, I, I, I promise the book is fun. It's not as boring as Probably I made it sound. No, come on. No, you didn't make it sound boring. Everyone, come on. Read the book. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I, it's really an honor to be here and to be chosen as part of the program. And to be doing it for LA Public Library is really also a huge honor. So it's such a great organization and series to be part of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us, Charles. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everyone have a good Sunday.
Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we hope you'll check out all the other Big Read programs that are going on through the month of May uh, throughout the city. Uh, but for the library, you can go to lapl.org forward slash Big Read, B-I-G dash R-E-A-D. And I know there's a really cool program coming up at, at the Chinatown branch this coming right. Thursday. So check out that website and you can get all the information. Okay. Until next time, we truly do appreciate your support. The success of our Big Read programs and all of our library programs couldn't happen without the support of viewers like you. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.